and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and today I'm going to be concluding this little series of videos that I've been doing on the Carol Con. Of course, over the past few weeks, I've gone over all of the lines of the Carol Con. Just to briefly show you once again, Carol Con, of course, starts after e4, c6, and d4 is the main variation. Um, so d4, of course, followed by d5. And then we looked at the advance variation, we looked at the exchange variations, we looked at the classical variations, uh, and we, we dove pretty deep into all of those. But today, I wanted to kind of round out the repertoire uh, against 1e4 by introducing some of the sidelines that uh, white can play. Uh, of course, these include various lines such as uh, 2d3, which kind of goes into the suit, or not the pseudo panov. The pseudo panov is also a line we'll be taking a look at. But after 2d3, white goes into the king's Indian attack type of structures. Uh, of course, the king's Indian attack, like the king's Indian defense for black, except it is an opening for white. Aha. Little mic adjustment. I'm just gonna take the jacket off. It's hot in here. Okay. So uh, d3 entering the king's Indian attack type of structures. Uh, the king's Indian attack, like the king's Indian defense, except with the white pieces. So expect white to see uh, to play common moves like this fianchetto, bring this knight out to d2, and go for stuff like f4 in in the near to, to late future. Uh, and so I wanted to introduce. Uh, a line for black against this that still follows a lot of the Karo Khan uh, ideas. So of course, I'm going to recommend you start with d5. It's the whole point of the Karo Khan. You support the center uh, in order to push this move d5. So that's what we do here. Now, by far the most common response for white is knight d2. And the reason is white likes to block off this file to avoid any queen traits. Now here, if white plays the move knight f3 first, you do have this option to take on e4 and take on d1. You're by no means obligated to play like this. You can still just go for your normal stuff with g6. Uh, and against knight d2, that is what I'm going to recommend. I'm going to recommend the move g6. Uh, knight f3 would stop uh, black's most common move, which is e5. But uh, knight f3, of course, does nothing to stop this move g6. So our repertoire is kind of safe against this move order trickery. So g6. Now the most common move for white is knight f3, and this is what we kind of call a system for white. So white has a, a few different move orders he can choose from, but in the end, he's going to play more or less the same setup. So he's kind of just playing a system. No matter what black's doing, white is going to, to, to kind of play these moves in some order. And so because of that, black also has some freedom to uh, pick what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. So this is just one of the setups that I'm recommending. So g6, bishop g7, the natural follow-up, White will fianchetto at some point, and I'm going to recommend black goes for this nice move, e5. So, uh, very common in chess openings, one player will try to seize the center, and the other player will try to play against the center, trying to uh, attack the center from the wings, trying to attack uh, perhaps an overextended center. But the fact is, controlling the center is still going to be important. So, when your opponent doesn't see central squares like e5, it's generally good to take them, even if you're a little bit concerned that it might come under fire at a later date. So e5, definitely going to be the idea here for black. Now bishop g2 is logical for white. And I recommend the move knight e7, just to not interfere with this bishop. You need this bishop to kind of support e5. Now white's going to go ahead and castle. Like I said, white's playing a system. He's just almost always going to play these moves in some order. And I'm going to recommend that black castles as well. And this is where we kind of arrive at the first big branch of the king's Indian attack for white. Uh, white really does have a few different options uh, he can try here. And I'm curious if the chat room at home already knows some of these plans. So see if you know some of the common plans for white here. Uh, try and come up with it at home. I'm going to pull up the chat on my phone here which I failed to do because I was running against the clock. Here we go. And I've got you guys now. Hello, hello to everyone. Uh, I've disappointed Dennis. I promised I would go over his glorious win against Jonathan in the Danish, Danish but I did not, unfortunately. 
end up preparing Dennis's Deadly Danish, perhaps another week. So Sarah says F4, uh, and this is in fact one of the common ideas for white. You know, this is the ca counterpart to the King's Indian Defense. Of course, in the king King's Indian Defense, playing for F5 is the main idea for black. And similarly, white can do such things here. But the move order is, is rather important. It's pretty rare that you see uh, the white player go for something like knight e1 here. This has actually never been played, just trying to do this directly. And uh, there's a few reasons for it. One, I imagine the move f5 might actually be strong for black. Uh, the reason being, white's just a little bit too slow with this configuration of the pieces to, to kind of play like this. Black is also fianchettoed, and moves like f5 really challenge the white's center, and white is just kind of playing down tempi. Um, the other reason for that is perhaps it's a little bit more common to go for those types of plans directly if the move order knight c3 to knight e2 has been played, which in this case, due to our opening choice, this knight almost always ends up on the d2 square. So 91 and f4 directly doesn't quite make so much sense. In fact, it makes even less sense because black is not committed to putting this pawn on the d4 square. So f4, while it looks uh, convenient, it might actually, if uh, black just does nothing, be convenient for black to take this pawn and just open up this bishop on the nice long diagonal. We don't make any weaknesses in our center just yet. So f4 isn't going to be the idea just yet. Uh, much more common, uh, I will say, is uh, things such as the move rook e1 and the move c3. These are both uh, really common ways for white to play. So the reason rook e1 sometimes gets played is it does ask black uh, some pretty awkward questions here. Namely, it makes a threat of e takes d5 when in fact this pawn is going to be attacked twice. So now white uh, or black has to, uh, to make some decisions. It is possible to play a move like knight d7 and just support the center even further, but you're starting to get in your own pieces way a little bit, and uh, white can start doing things like, like v4, trying to gain a little bit of space on, on this queen side. Um, so rather, I like just playing the move d4. This is kind of white's goal with the move rook e1 to induce d4 to try and get black to overcommit to this central idea. But controlling center space uh, definitely has its benefits uh, as, as opposed to its downsides. Now d4, of course, gives up a square. That square is on c4. And so the most common move here uh, for white is knight c4, when you can go into some complicated lines with b5, when knight c takes e5 is not so good due to this move f6, trapping the knight. And then the knight likely will retreat. And black is going to start playing on the queen side. So the move I wanted to look at is actually the main move, uh, a4. I think this is a better move for white because it prepares knight c4 and, and doesn't allow this move b5 to come quite so quickly. Uh, okay, so a4, and the move I'm going to recommend for black is actually this move c5. So it's starting to look just like a normal king's Indian defense, uh, except, of course, the colors are reversed. And so the plans are going to largely be the same. Now that black has fully committed to the center here, white is likely going to switch back to common plans like f4, and in the meantime, black is going to try to expand on this queen side in order to make his extra space count. Uh, and so you can kind of fall back on these plans if you're familiar at all with the, the position with the colors reversed. It's going to be very useful to you here, because you really are just playing the same type of position. So of course, this means black's plans in these positions all kind of revolve around this queen side. The c4 square is going to be really, really crucial here. So common move for white is knight c4, and you can respond to this with knight bc6, uh, simply guarding this e5 pawn. Uh, guarding the e5 pawn, as I said. And then uh, from here, there are a couple options. Uh, I like the move rook f1. I think this is the most instructive. So white plays rook e1 and only then drops it back to f1. Seems a little counterintuitive, but as I said, the point of rook e1 was to threaten e takes d and force black's hand into playing d4. Now that that purpose is fulfilled, it's going to step back to f1 and start aiming for uh, f4, f5. Now there are a variety of ways you can really play here. You can start going for things like b6, a6, and b5, 
although this can be a little bit slow. And so the plan I like best is the plan played in the game. You go for bishop e6 and wait for the correct opportunity to actually snap off this knight on c4. And once this knight disappears from the board, you're free to kind of break up in the center and uh, start creating uh, some openings on this side of the board. So instead of bishop e6 directly, you might be running into uh, knight g5, and you're not quite ready to take on c4. So the move played in the game is h6, simply guarding this g5 square, preparing bishop e6, and waiting for the right moment to actually snap off this knight. So knight e1 was played in the game, and now bishop e6 makes a lot of sense. Uh, and white continues with f4. So how do you want to respond to f4 with black here? There's actually a variety of options you can go for. Of course, you can take it. You can also ignore it and play something else. Uh, or you can go for a move like f5. So your options are taking this, playing f5 to try and uh, stop these pushes from white, or just do something else in entirely. Uh, for example, you could capture here. You could play a move like a6, a move like b6, a move like rook b8 do any of those things. So, so what does the, the YouTube chat at home think about this position? What do you think? What do you think? Mm -mm, just waiting for the chat to catch up with me on this one. F4 is white's big break, and we have to find a way to respond. So Lutrum Bagoli says the move F5 directly. Okay, and someone else says the move Queen to D7. So these are both pretty reasonable moves. Uh, a lot of people now saying F5. Uh, two people want to capture on F4, and one person wants to play the move F6. So we're, we're kind of split here. And the fact is, there's actually a few reasonable moves here. The move played in the game is the response that I actually quite like for black, and that is actually to take on f4. Now, uh, white more or less, uh, I guess you don't have to recapture with the pawn, but, but white does in the game. The point being, you just want to keep the threats of, of playing f5 uh, alive. Now, as for the other options for black, let's just take a quick look here. If you play the move f5, I think it's just a little bit too much. In fact, this is probably helping white open things up favorably for him. Of course, black looking to open things on the queen side, white actually looking to open things on uh, the king side in, in the center. So for example, white could even consider opening everything up here, and then it just becomes kind of a fight on the king side. Uh, white, of course, could also consider just opening up this nice diagonal for the bishop, playing a move like queen e2, and increasing the pressure on, on the center. And if now we play uh, f takes e, e takes f4, well, there's a nasty, nasty threat on e6. So f5 is probably my least favorite of, of the options. It just allows white to kind of open up this bishop a little bit. And we've already created some, some tender spots in our camp by pushing uh, these pawns. The move f6 is actually a really interesting try, and I don't think this is a bad move at all, although it does slightly uh, kind of allow white to continue with the plan. Moves like f5 are still always going to be a threat. You know, you, you kind of just have to keep your eyes open for moves like f5 here. For example, even immediately, you could consider it with some sacrifices coming on the board, and moves like queen h5 uh, just starting to create some threats uh, along these open files now. But f6, definitely worth considering just to support this e5 pawn even more. Uh, but as I said, uh, well, first of all, you could, you could ignore it, but then the move f5 really does start to get uh, pretty powerful here. It does start to get pretty powerful. If you take, take, and take, well, then the move knight takes e6, and, and you're, you're already losing a piece. So got to be careful of f5. So ignoring it, really the only wrong response. f5, I think just a little bit too weakening here. f6, definitely a really interesting option, but I like the move e takes f4. And after g takes f4, then the other move suggested comes into play, queen d7. And the idea is you just keep a firm grip on the f5 square, but black actually has a, a subtler intention with the move queen d7. So after knight f3, try and find black's next move uh, and come up with, with a reason why. You know, there is a definite plan behind black's next move. And I may have already talked to you a little bit about what that plan might be. Just 
just a little bit about what that plan might be. I think it'd, ju it'd just be a little bit too early for a bishop takes c4 blog it. We can look at it again. Uh, so someone suggests the move bishop h3. It's not really the, the point of black's play here. We, we're not super interested in trading off these bishops. This bishop is not actually white's best piece here on g2, and this bishop is doing a lot for us right now. It's doing a lot. Key defender. Okay, so we're not really looking to attack white on the king side in this type of position. Uh, the king side is where white has more space for the moment. See, like, white kind of has control over, over this side of the board here. Meanwhile, we only have this much space for our, our pieces. You know, we can put the pieces out in front of the pawns, but it's not ideal for, for attacking. So you don't really want to go after white's king on the side where you have less space here. It just doesn't make quite enough sense. White wants to play knight h4, maybe. That definitely could be the case. Bishop g4 by black, maybe. So I don't like these moves on, on the king side. Uh, I don't think we need to overcommit our pieces to the king side here. We need an active plan for black. So someone suggested a6 with the idea of b5, and this is a pretty, pretty standard plan in king's Indian structures, but the move a5 is really going to be uh, a little bit of a cold shower for uh, the black player here. Now you're never gonna get b5 through, white is always going to take on passant, and you're, you're not really achieving control of c4, which is, is kind of the goal with a6. So a6 doesn't quite work. And I think b6 with the idea of a6 and b5 is just, it's a little bit slow. It's a little bit slow here. So the move played in the game, no one suggested. It's actually the move rook a d8. Uh, and uh, of course, what's the point of rook a d8? Well, the point is, after white's next move, uh, in the game it was queen e1, black wants to take on c4 and push through to d3. He wants to open up this diagonal for the bishop, open up this file for his pieces, and open up the d4 square for the knight as well. This is how uh, black is looking to get activity in this position. And in fact, this is what was played in the game. Now, if white takes a slightly slower approach and plays a move like b3 after rook d8, uh, black actually has quite a number of options here. Uh, you can even still consider capturing this knight when after b takes c4. Uh, you can start to go for things like b6 now. And just think about cementing a knight on the queen side, giving white some problems, and slowly going for the plan of a6 and b5. Uh, the play on the, the king side is still going to be uh, pretty immediate, but with a, a knight on b4 especially, you do have some threats over here. But even better than this, I think, is playing the move f5, this move which I told you guys not to play moments ago. So what has changed? Why is f5 better here? Well, the reason is simply we've included this move e takes f4 and g takes f4. So with this inclusion, white is going to be left with a very awkward pawn on the f4 square that really gets in the way of all of white's pieces. By all of the pieces, I mean this bishop and this rook in particular. These two pieces cannot really influence the king's side with this pawn in the way. Uh, it's true, white could still open things up with captures or push, for example, of captures, but now it is actually black who is benefiting the most. Perhaps we'll insert this move yet again, and then play knight takes f5. And we are really looking at some critical squares here, and we are the ones who have taken over on, on this side of the board. In fact, uh, the e-file is going to be uh, what black looks to use in this game. So I like the move f5 here uh, in particular if uh, white decides to play things a little bit more slowly. And in fact, we could even consider moves like f5 on this turn as well, uh, although e5 is, is likely white's response. And then still just playing for this similar stuff, looking for these kinds of squares in the center. And long term, we still have this plan of b6, a6, and b5. This is kind of what we can fall back on after we solidify things on the king's side just a little bit. Um, yeah, someone else mentions uh, a tactic. Uh, a6 does, in fact, actually just hang knight b6. But even in the general sense, for example, with this queen on d8 still, 
Um, obviously, you can't play it here, but a5 is, is going to be a, a good response to, uh, to a6 in, in most positions. Um, but okay. So in the game, though, white did not adopt this slower approach with b3. Uh, if he did, I once again was going to recommend a move like f5 to just kind of challenge the center. Instead, though, uh, queen e1 was played, bishop takes c4, d takes c4, and now d3. And this is just going to be a really pleasant position for, uh, for black here. If white tried c3, perhaps it would have been a little bit of a better attempt. Moves like knight a5, though, are going to come onto the board. And these things are, are all kind of going to be hanging. These squares and these pawns are, are going to have a tough time surviving. Instead, though, c takes d3 was played, queen takes d3, and now black is simply much better. Uh, e5 was played, knight f5, and black is firmly in control of all the key squares in the position. Rook a3 allows black to capture c4, and this game uh, ended pretty routinely for black from here on out, uh, I do believe. I haven't analyzed the rest of this game too much in depth because I was more focused on the opening, but yeah, it looks like things really did just go black's way. Up an extra pawn, and then trading down in this end game, and he ends up simply winning with this B pawn. Excellent game from Black. Now, uh, I know you see names on your screen, but we actually diverted from the main uh, game here. This was actually a game between uh, Andriasian and uh, Dreyev. So those two players playing this game. And it all comes back to this move, rookie one. This is where we deviated. I, I probably should have mentioned, first of all. In the main game, we're going to look at another move for white, which is the move b4, trying to take control of c5. But to recap this, this last line that we looked at here, this is kind of the more traditional way of playing King's Indian types of structures. White forces black to kind of take the center with a move like d4, and then goes for these plans with f4. And black has these various options to respond to them. And which one is going to be best just depends on the position. So let's recap here. Uh, Rook e1, the move d4 is what was played in this game. It's what I'm suggesting as well. And then the move a4 is nice for white to gain control of this c4 square. c5 for black now is starting to advance on the queen side, defending the center. We see knight c4, knight c6, attacking the center and defending the center. Now rook back to f1, preparing f4. And black decides to put this bishop on e6 by first controlling uh, knight g5. Then we have bishop e6, f4. We have a few ways to deal with f4. The main point is you just cannot really allow the move f5 to come on the board. So a move like queen d7 would be perfectly fine. Uh, a move like f5 I think is a little bit too weakening this early on. And I liked black's response in the game. e takes f4, forcing uh, white to kind of make the decision of how he wants to recapture. g takes f4 is the best recapture for white in this case. And then moves like f5 become very, very reasonable, uh, really at any point in, in the future of this game now. In the game, though, queen d7 stops f5, prepares the move rook d8, and then black went in for this move bishop takes c4, pushing through with d3 and activating the pieces. So this is just kind of one way that a game in the King's Indian uh, structure can go. Of course, no game is, is going to be exactly alike, but hopefully this is a good introduction to those kinds of ideas. Now, let's back up to that move on move 8. Uh, where we first look at the, looked at this move, rookie one. In the main game, I want to look at, I want to examine the move b4. So this is a slightly different way of approaching this king's Indian structure. Uh, with b4, white is attempting to gain control of the c5 square. We saw in the previous game, of course, black plays c5 and, and is always threatening things like c4. So b4 is an attempt to cut that off before it ever gets started by taking control of c5. So what should black do in response? I'm willing to bet you guys at home might be able to, to figure this one out, actually. Uh, the, the main move for black here. And also the best move. What do you guys think? Waiting on the chat. Waiting on the chat to catch up. How do we respond to this move B4? So yeah, they, they uh, are with me now after some delay. It is, in fact, this move A5. Uh, this is kind of the problem with the move B4. You are simply not 
fully prepared to commit to defending this pawn. If you play the move c3, well now the move a takes b4 and c takes b4 could come on the board and you really have no way now to, to challenge the d4 square and your pawn is still going to come under some fire after the move knight a6 and really it's, it's not so easy to, to keep this pawn handled. Of course the move a3 is met with knight takes b4. So rather than that, uh, white almost exclusively takes this pawn off on a5. And the point of all this for white was to gain some slightly more rapid development on the queen side. So he gives up this uh, b4 pawn for the a5 pawn, which seemingly is a very good trade for black. It activates the queen, uh, puts some pressure on this a2 pawn. What does white get in exchange? Well, white can play very, very quickly with this move bishop b2. And the point now for white is that after the main move d4, uh, well, after knight b3, this move c3 is going to come for white. And after c3, white is actually looking to break down this entire structure for black, uh, not from the base of the pawn chain with something like f4 going after the e5 pawn, but instead from the head of the pawn chain with something like c3 going after this d4 pawn more directly. Uh, so in the game, queen c7 was played, and white wasted no time uh, immediately playing this move c3. So what should we do about c3? What can be done? There's a couple options here. Uh, and I'll let you guys at home try, try and work this one out. What can you do about this move c3? <clears throat> I'm going to give you just a second to think about it. And then I'm going to start talking before I actually see responses. Because the delay just doesn't work out with this, uh, this question and answer format. So take a second to think about it still. Okay, so of course, hopefully the two options you came up with at home are the moves c5, supporting the center uh, in this manner, and the move d takes c3. Uh, d takes c3 is a really interesting option for black to permanently change the structure. So c5 is a fine move for black. Uh, black's not really doing worse after this. The move c takes d4 could come on the board, and after c takes d4, you do just have some kind of open game on the queen side here. And I think black might be slightly preferred in this type of position. White can play a move like a4, taking some space. Uh, moves like bishop a3 can come. And the play is just going to be on, on the queen side now. For example, knight bc6, queen c2, bishop b6, for example. Um, sorry, maybe bishop g4, for example. Bishop b6 would mean knight g5. And then a move like rook fb1. And you know, the play is just kind of shifting to this side of the board where not too much uh, has really been proven in either side's favor. Uh, but the move I'm going to recommend is actually, sorry, the, the other choice here, that is the move d takes c3. And I like this a lot better for black because it's a slightly more imbalanced position, and it's imbalanced, I, I believe, in black's favor. Uh, so of course, after bishop takes c3, we have these two pawns against these two pawns on the queen side. This is kind of the structure. And if you look very, very carefully, you might notice that these two pawns are connected, and this pawn is backwards, and this pawn is isolated. And it's for that simple reason that I really prefer the, the black side here. And the move c5 was played in the game, and I think was correct. c5 is going to be followed now by b5, and black is always going to be threatening moves like c4 to create a passed pawn. And that's exactly how the rest of this game went. So this is, once again, really the nature of the King's Indian attack. Uh, white is going to throw something at your center, and it's all about finding the best way to respond to the position uh, in the moment. You know, this can be in a few different ways, depending on the specifics of the position. So in this case, d takes c3 ended up being the right call, because after d takes c3, white has this permanent weakness in the structure, and you get to play with a little bit more freedom with your pawns. So this turned out to be a really nice position for black in this game, and he did, in fact, end up winning. And the game continued with knight fd2, and now simply b5 is taking away a lot of squares from the white player. Queen c2 is played in the game, now knight a6 is getting developed, rook fc1, bishop b6, and the black pieces all flow very naturally into the game. Uh, this knight comes over to c6, and you can really see the game is now all about these two pawns, and they turn out to be more of a, a strength than a weakness here, taking away all these squares from white and leaving these two pawns on weak half-open files. Knight e3 in the game, and then black simply just broke through with c4. And now, white went in for some bad tactics that ended up uh, quite simply just losing the game.
Uh, b takes c4, b takes c4, and then white goes for knight d5. A strange little intermezzo, uh, trying to hit the queen. But now black simply takes on b3 and is challenging white's queen as well. Knight takes c7 in the game, b takes c2, knight takes a8, and now knight d4 was the clever move from uh, uh, Cheparinov here, uh, simply guarding this pawn on c2. Knight b6 is an attempt to save the knight, but now rook b8 hits the knight again, and this knight is, is looking a little bit stuck. Knight e2 check is coming, and there's no way to really stop all the threats. Bishop a5 was tried in the game, and now bishop h6 is simply attacking this rook. Bishop f1, and the rest is, is kind of history here. Knight c6, and takes, and black easily won this game up a full knight. Up a full knight. Perhaps not as easily as he should have won it, but he did end up winning it with this extra knight. Uh, so it was a really impressive game from uh, Ivan uh, Cheparinov there. Hopefully I'm not saying that too horribly wrong. And it just goes to show another game in the King's Indian attack, the various uh, ways that white can challenge your strong center and the various ways you can respond to that. Um, okay, hopefully you have a good feel for that kind of position. Uh, the King's Indian structures are some of the most complex in all of chess, in my opinion. So it's, it's tough to give you a full... Uh, full feel of the position in just one lecture here, but uh, hopefully it's a good introduction and it gives you some idea of the options for black in that type of position. Now I wanted to move on to the next sideline in the Karo Khan, uh, and this time I'm going to be talking about the pseudo Panov attack. So earlier uh, in the this little series of Karo lectures I've been doing, of course went over the Panov attack, which starts with you know one e4, c6, d4, d5 takes, takes, and then the move c4. This is the main move order for the Panov attack. Now the pseudo Panov attack is like the Panov attack, except pseudo. So instead of going for d4 directly, immediately exchanging off with e takes d5, uh, in this case, white is going to go for the slightly trickier move c4. Uh, and with this move order, white delays playing the move d4, and sometimes he doesn't do it for any good reason. Sometimes white just plays d4 anyways uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but sometimes white goes for some real sidelines where you delay playing d4 for a while and you try to use the extra tempo uh, with white to do something useful. Uh, now what I'm going to recommend here is simply just playing the move d5 as normal. No need to deviate from the status quo on this one. Uh, and the main uh, moves here for white are simply to capture this pawn uh, twice. Uh, of course, in this position, white could simply play d4, and we are just perfectly back in our main line of the uh, Panov attack. But c takes d5, much more common here. And now the move knight f6 is what I'm going to recommend for black. Uh, you can play the move queen takes d5, but you're just walking into knight c3, kind of for no reason. So. I recommend the move knight f6, just trying to regain this pawn in the most natural way possible. And now once again, it is possible to transpose into the main main stuff uh, in the pan off. So I'm talking knight c3, now black could capture on uh, d5 here, and at any moment now white can play d4 and you are just back in the main line of, of the pan off. Instead though, white could play a move like knight f3. Now knight c6, and if d4 here, we just really fully have transposed, and if bishop b5, well then white has kind of committed to a suboptimal square for the bishop, so I'm just going to recommend the move e6. And now, uh, it's true that we didn't get our bishop out to g4 before playing e6, but white put his bishop on this slightly silly square on b5, when it would much rather be behind a d4 pawn sitting on d3. So both sides have kind of gained something and left something behind. And now I'm not going to spend too much time analyzing these kind of lines, because you just get a fairly standard position with an isolated queen's pawn, and those uh, are uh, positions for, for another lecture. In fact, I've taught lectures on isolated queen's pawn, queen pawns before, so if you're confused on those, go watch another lecture. <laughs> um, in the main line I want to go over today, though, uh, of course, I'm going over the Karo sidelines, so I want to go over the ones that don't really transpose quite so easily. So. The move I wanted to look at in the main variation is this move, queen a4 check. Uh, this is a move aimed at actually making it a little bit more awkward for black to regain his pawn here on d5. With queen a4 check, you're using this pawn as white to prevent the knight from coming to c6, and you're forcing black to make some slightly awkward decisions. 
The line I'm going to recommend is the main one with knight bd7. Uh, and the point now for white is after knight c3, obviously this pawn is not yet capturable. So uh, I ask you now if you at home can come up with a way to develop the black pieces here. How can you develop the black pieces with this super annoying pawn sitting on d5? What can you do? What can you guys at home figure out for black? I'll give you just a moment to think about it. I'm going to start explaining it anyways. As I said, it's a bit silly to wait the full time for the delay. Uh, OK, so hopefully you came up with some options. Of course, the move e6 is going to be just totally fatal. You can't really play this and get your bishop out like this. You're actually just giving up a full pawn and totally destroying your structure in the center. So there are a couple options for black. I'm going to recommend the line with g6. And with g6, you are simply preparing to develop your bishop out to g7 and castle this way. You leave this pawn on d5, and it seems like it's a really, really annoying pawn, but in fact, you can kind of develop around it, and this pawn on d5 is not going to remain there permanently. It's very difficult to defend with the white pieces, and you'll regain it at a later date. Uh, I also wanted to mention the move a6. The move a6 is also a totally playable line. Uh, if knight f3, uh, you're simply going to go back for more g6 stuff, or even go for immediate ideas here on the queen side with bishop b7 follow. So this is also a, a pretty fine way of playing. Uh, the move b6 was suggested. I don't know how I feel about the move b6. I don't feel good, I think. You're just weakening these light squares a little bit too much, I think. Uh, I think it's much better to go for the moves a6 and b5, than the structure with a7 and b6, when all of these light squares just start to feel a little bit too tender for my liking. So the main move, though, g6 is what I recommend for black. White's going to continue development in one way or another. White can also just play the move d4, but in classic pseudo panoff style, uh, for some reason, white decides he doesn't want to play this move. So bishop g7, bishop c4, and kingside castles is pretty standard stuff here. Uh, pretty standard stuff. Now. Uh, white usually actually goes for the move d3 instead of d4 here. And the reason is, he just wants this nice open diagonal, uh, perhaps for a bishop on e3. He wants to support this bishop on c4, and he wants to control the e4 square as well. So the pawn on d3 achieves these things, whereas the pawn on d4 might end up just being a little bit of a target on this diagonal for this bishop. So now, Black is going to continue very naturally with the move a6. Like I said, just guarding some of these light squares around the camp. Now, rather than walk into things like uh, b5, I don't know if it would work immediately here. For example, if a move like bishop e3, I don't think you can play b5 just yet. But uh, rather than ever allow a, a fork to happen, queen a3 is by far the main move. Also putting some pressure on e7 and keeping in mind some d6 ideas. So this is the main move for white, and now black is simply going to play b6 and develop the bishop out here. So this is how you kind of develop around this d5 pawn. You just fianchetto both bishops, and then life is perfectly fine. Now white's going to find the castle, black can play bishop b7 and start targeting this pawn, and now moves like rook e1 are going to come on the board. White's going to put a little bit of pressure on e7, no worries though, just rook e8. And the main move here is actually knight g5, preparing to reroute over to uh, e4. Rook c8 was played in the game, and this is totally uh, uh, fine, pretty comfortable actually, for the black player. Now, white could try to desperately hold on to e5, with a, or d5 rather, with a move like bishop e3, but now black can play moves like uh, knight e5, and it's becoming really, really impossible actually to hold on to all of these pawns in the center. I don't think there's really a move here for white that holds on to uh, everything. So much more common, and what was played in this game, is actually just the move d6. Uh, d6, removing this pawn from all these threats of capture, uh, and challenging e7 once again. So of course though, black is not so naive as to take this pawn and allow bishop takes f7. Instead the move e6 comes on the board, uh, stunting this diagonal. And you just leave this d6 pawn here, uh, and you're kind of just going to sweep it up at a later date. Uh, this pawn is way too far uh, up the board in order to be defensible, and so the idea for black is you've already developed your pieces around this d5 pawn, you're in no rush to really take it back, 
and uh, your position is, is just going to be totally fine here. So e6, bishop f4 was played in the game. Now black finally expands with the move b5, bishop drops back to b3, and the move knight c5 comes on the board. So you see all of the black pieces really just have natural developed squares, this knight coming to d5 at a later date, this nice knight on c5 hitting some weaknesses, and that's really all you can ask for from the opening here. So black's pieces, natural squares, serving purposes, active squares, and black is just going to look to regain the d6 pawn later. So rook a d1 played in the game, and then black continued with knight h5, hitting this bishop, opening up this bishop, and finally coming to collect. Bishop e3 was played, hitting the knight on c5, so knight takes b3, a takes b3, and then black went for this move f5, taking away some nice hops for these horsies. So no hops for the horsies, f5 instead takes away the e4 square. Knight h3 was played, and then bishop f8. And it's like I said, this pawn just too far up the board. At some point, it's going to fall into black's clutches. So bishop c5 tries to hold on, but now uh, black actually plays a really nice move here. So I'll let you guys at home try and find black's next move to secure an advantage. See if you can find it. Black's next move secures a solid advantage. Okay, hopefully you guys at home found it. Uh, again, I'm not going to totally wait the full delay. The move, of course, is rook takes c5, sacrificing the exchange, and then you are finally winning this pawn back. If you want to play a little bit more conservatively, I suppose you couldn't really play the move uh, rook c6. Well, I guess you could actually. You could just play rook c6 and take this guy back. I was worried about d7 for a second, but these tactics don't amount to anything. So the game might continue d7, takes, 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 and, and black is doing totally fine here as well. But I like black's move, rook takes c5, sacrificing the exchange, getting the bishop pair, getting the pawn back, and these open diagonals are just going to be devastating, devastating for black. So it looks like a few people got it. Gavin Paul, I'm a docs gamer, Fat Cheese Stick, it's a good username, Fat Cheese Stick found the answer. Uh, the move, of course, is rook takes c5, giving up the exchange, and now these are just devastating bishops on some of the longest diagonals on the board. And in this game, uh, white ended up simply crumbling. Uh, let's take a look at how it happened. Queen e3, queen c7, g3 tries to stunt these bishops. Now queen c6 switches diagonals. g3 strengthens the dark squares, but weakens the light squares. And it's very apparent here. Now f3 for white tries to hold everything together. Uh, and in the game, uh, black simply uh, went in for queen takes f3, and it threw away some of the advantage. A little bit better would be to play the move e5, uh, just taking more control of the position, bringing this knight back to f6, and be in no rush, really, to, uh, to continue playing. Uh, for example, the game could continue knight or, or e5, the move d4 takes advantage of this pin, knight f6 unpins, and then a move like, uh, I don't know, even queen f2, but already things are, are kind of falling apart. You can reroute this bishop even to b6, and this king's just not gonna have got, not gonna have a safe home. Instead, though, queen takes f3 was fine for black in the game. Takes takes, rook d2, and then uh, black managed to coordinate with the bishops against the rook, and ended up winning this game. We see a takes and a takes, and then with the better pawn structure, uh, black ended up pushing to f4, got this rook and knight active, and, wait, did he even win this game? I don't even remember. Looks like he didn't win this game. Looks like it was a draw. But black had a much better position. So good enough for a draw in this case. Probably should have been good enough for more. Uh, if you followed all of those last moves there, congratulations to you. You have superhuman speed. But the point is, black had a very, very crushing advantage earlier on in this game. Um, I suppose that's my fault for not watching to the end of the game. But it doesn't matter. It's an openings class, not an endgame class. Uh, once again, the point of this opening for white is to get a, a slightly annoying pawn on d5 and make it difficult for black to recapture. However, fortunately for black, you can always develop around this pawn with these kinds of ideas, and the pawn will prove to be overextended in good time. 
Uh, as always in the opening, just look for good pieces or good squares to put your pieces on, uh, good ways to improve your pieces, and then you should be doing just fine. Mm -mm. So this, of course, is the pseudo Panov attack. Uh, the Panov normally coming after d4, the pseudo Panov coming after c4. And in most lines, uh, against most players, you're just going to transpose into a normal Panov with d4 at some moment. But if white wants to stick to his guns and prove that the pseudo Panov is a legitimate opening, then he will uh, try to keep this pawn on d5. And once again, you just develop the pieces around this pawn. Okay, with the last 15 minutes, I wanted to introduce uh, one of my favorite sidelines against the Karo Khan. Uh, it's my favorite for black. I don't play it with white because it's bad. Uh, it does, though, have by far the best name of any of the Karo Khan variations. And actually, just give me one second here while I type in the players' names with PGN tags. Somehow I missed this one. We have, of course, Magnus Carlsen against Wesley So. And after all, it must be a good opening if Magnus Carlsen is playing, again, playing it against Wesley So, right? So, so there you go. Point proven. It's a great line. Um, that, that's a lie, by the way. Magnus plays all kinds of terrible openings all the time uh, just because he likes playing chess. So e4, c6, and then the shocker on move two, the move that no one saw coming. It is, of course, the move... Ready? Ready, everyone? Bishop to c4. Uh, now, for those of you at home who have not seen this before, bishop c4 is known as the hillbilly attack. Don't ask me why it's known as the hillbilly attack. Likely, I don't know, someone just thought it was funny. Uh, I was trying to come up with some analogy to actual hillbillies, but I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So bishop c4. Now, this move does not make a ton of sense. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. Uh, white develops this bishop out to c4, and of course, it just walks right into black's next move, the move d5. Uh, and this is simply gaining time on the bishop for black. So... Uh, with this this line, the bishop simply has to retreat, and now from here, um, black is, is simply going to have uh, a, a pretty distinct advantage. I think you can guess the next move. The main next move is actually going to be d takes e4. d takes e4 uh, is going to be good enough for black, and whoops, sorry, I just switched main variations here. but. Uh, in the main game I wanted to look at, Black actually played e6, and this is the game between Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So. And e6 is more or less fine for Black, but really there's no reason to not take here uh, on e4. So this is the line I'm going to recommend. I wanted to quickly show this line with e6, just to show you how things can start to go a little bit wrong. In the game, knight c3 was played, knight f6, d3, and you had d takes e4, knight takes e4, knight takes, pawn takes, and queen takes d1, and king takes uh, d1. And now you really just end up in a version of the end game line that I, I showed earlier in the stream with the king's Indian attack, and Wesley so ended up actually losing this game despite being totally fine out of the opening. I do want to mention this was a very, very t fast time control. In fact, I think it was uh, one of those chess.com speed chess championships. So we won't go into this one in too much depth. The main line I want to look at now is d takes e4. So this is by far the best move for black. You, you simply take the, the free pawn here, and then you're up a pawn. And that's, that's the story of the hillbilly attack. Uh, white just loses a pawn. So the main move now is the move that Carlson played in the game. It is the move uh, queen h5. Uh, okay. So queen h5 here. And let me just do this. And queen h5, of course, makes a threat. It makes a threat. Be careful. Be careful, don't play the move e5. The move e5, worst move in the position. I found it, there's no move worse than e5, you can quote me on that. But the move e6 is, is gonna be totally fine for black here. And black, once again, is up a pawn. So don't get checkmated. Now the move knight c3 threatens to take your pawn back. So of course you should develop with tempo, hit the queen, defend the pawn, perfectly fine. Queen h4 was played in the game. And black just plays the move, knight bd7. Now, if white really wants to, white can recapture this pawn here on e4. But the fact is, it's just going to be a little bit silly for white to play like this. Uh, white has just lost uh, a ton of tempi. Black has made no weaknesses. And black has some pretty free development now with, with bishop d6. You know, this queen traveling all across the board is not the ideal way to play the opening for white. 
So keeping in line with the opening, Magnus continued with the move F3, offering up another pawn in exchange for more development. Now, if you really want to be brave, you can play the move E takes F3, and after Knight takes F3, White gets one free developing move in exchange for a pawn, which is not worth it. Uh, Black is much better here. But I like the move played in the game, uh, and that move is knight c5. It guards the e4 square and just threatens to, uh, to take off this, this bishop on b3. Magnus in the game, captured on e4. And now the move knight f takes e4 is uh, the nice tactical justification for black's last move. Uh, you cannot take back here as the queen hangs. And if queen takes d8, which was played in the game, simply king takes d8, knight takes e4, knight takes e4. And now we see that white's pressing uh, advantage from the first move, you know, the, the huge uh, gain in development that it, he got with queen h5 with tempo has, has really dissipated into an end game down a pawn. Now, if your name is Magnus Carlsen, uh, you can in fact play like this at, at the World Blitz Championships uh, against, in this case, this line uh, was against Tomaszewski at the 2015 World Blitz. And if your name is Magnus Carlsen, you can play like this and still win the game. He, he managed to win this position with white here, which is a truly impressive feat. But if your name is not Magnus Carlsen, likely you were just very, very sad about your opening choice because uh, there is no downside for black here. Black is simply up upon, uh, up upon for nothing. So the, uh, the huge hillbilly attack uh, has not has not really worked out here for white. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, in hillbilly attack, I always see white taking with pawn on move three. Uh, that's that's interesting because this is really not the main move. I guess it's, it's playable as well, bishop b3, but the ideas are, are all going to be the same. Um, the downside for white now is that uh, you don't have this queen h5 stuff, which Magnus went for in, in his game. The upside is you're, you're not totally down a pawn. Uh, but also, what's what's the upside here? I, I, I'm not seeing the upside. Black just develops, has a strong pawn on d5, and you have a, a slightly nonsensical bishop on b3. In fact, if I'm honest with you, I expect later in the game, uh, white is going to be playing the move c3 and try to bring this bishop back to c2. So really no purpose in playing the hillbilly attack if this is going to be the, the way you play it. Because black's just going to end up with a pawn on d5, and it's it's going to be a strong point for black and, and really nothing doing now for, uh, for white. But okay, who wants to see Wesley So lose a really embarrassing game? Uh, I know I do. So okay, in Wesley So's game, he played e6. Uh, Magnus continued now with knight c3, knight f6, d3, and like, we, like I said earlier, they got into this end game. So of course, Wesley not accepting the free pawn on e4, perhaps a bit of a misstep. Free pawns are good. Knight d7 was played in the game, which is a perfectly fine move, then c3. Now knight c5, also a great move, getting this knight on a nice square, while it where it challenges both of these pieces. Uh, then bishop c2. Have I looked at two knight c3, three, queen f3? I have not looked at that variation, actually. I think I've faced that variation maybe once or twice in, in my uh, entire chess career. Uh, but I'll give it a brief mention after we see Wesley So lose. Knight f3, b6, bishop e3, bishop a6, and the fact is, white just simply got a little bit more space here with moves like b4, and b takes a5 now, king c1, bishop a3 check, king up to d2, rook hd8, and Wesley So was doing just fine until all of a sudden he wasn't. Uh, white takes off this pawn on a5, and then doesn't really get it back. And Wesley So now, down two pawns, ended up losing this game to Magnus Carlsen in the hillbilly attack. Uh, really unfortunate stuff for Wesley. So, okay, there was a question of a sideline that I had totally forgotten about, because who plays like this? There is this move, queen f3 here, to, to look out for. And it's another one of those variations where white is just going a little bit crazy. Um, the move d takes e4 is still going to be the move I recommend. Knight takes e4 now, recaptures this pawn. And you can just simply develop your pieces. Um, now knight d7, knight f6 is going to come. If the move bishop c4 happens, still just knight f6. It's totally, totally fine. 
Uh, against all these weird variations, black more or less plays the same way. You take on e4, you develop your pieces, you're better. That's that's what happens against sidelines in the Karakhan. I guess this lecture could have been a minute long where I said, white's going to play some garbage, you develop your pieces, take on e4, and then, then you're totally fine. Uh, but that's honestly the, the truth for these sidelines. So okay, d takes c4, knight takes c4. And then looking here, the main line is, is with d4, but you just develop your pieces, and once again, you're going to be totally fine. Even just e6 here is simple enough. You develop, you trade, you get your pieces out, and then life is good. Okay, any final questions before, uh, before I leave here? Uh, the fantasy variation is, is a, a comment I'm seeing in the chat. Um, in fact, uh, I've done so many of these Karakhan lectures now, I totally forgot I hadn't covered the fantasy yet. So stay tuned next week. Likely it'll be a fantasy variation lecture to, to actually complete the Karakhan here. I think the fantasy is worthy uh, of more than just an honorable mention in the sidelines lecture. So we'll give the fantasy its, its own lecture because it is a, a rather tricky opening that uh, deserves a little bit more, more comments. So stay tuned for next time. Mm -mm. We want to see the Grand Prix. The Grand Prix doesn't really work against the Karakhan. Doesn't really work. Okay, this is the last thing I'll go over, and then I think I'm going to call it here. If you are watching live, be sure to head over to the Twitch channel after this when I have an exciting tactical challenge for you on this tactics time. If white wants to play like this, the fact is you're just going to get into some Karakhan advanced positions, so I would recommend checking out that lecture. In fact, I think I might even mention this line in that lecture. Uh, the difference is, of course, white has committed to this move f4, when white didn't really need to commit to this move f4. So after the move like d4, the plans are going to be all the same as the advanced variation. You play c5, you develop these pieces, queen b6 is a common idea. Um, and you just follow those same same plans from the advanced Karakhan. Only difference is, this pawn's already on f4. Is it a good thing? Maybe not. Maybe not for white, actually. Okay. Should you change French defense for Karakhan? Yes. Next question. All right. I think that's uh, just about going to do it for us here. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this lecture on some sidelines against the Karakhan and how you should face them. Uh, my name is Caleb Denby, and stay tuned for more chess openings explained next week and a tactics time lecture on Twitch if you're watching live. Thank you very much for joining me, and I will see you next time.